cool. Well, it's 20, so I'm going to start, hey? Um, let's go. So, this is me. Um, I am a developer engagement lead at Microsoft. I've been there for nearly 10 years. So, you know, surviving the next few weeks, I will have my 10-year trophy <laughs> very soon. Um, you can find me on all those socials. If you scan that QR code, it will not recall you. It will uh, bring you to these socials, and you can follow me on those. Um, I also have these uh, business cards. These are NFC chips in a little pin that I have made. I have four different controllers. They're games controllers. And you just hold your phone to it, um, and it will, where you would put your credit card, and then it would bring up my link tree. The glorious thing about them is I have not locked them. So after you follow me on all the socials, you can reprogram it using a little app called NFC Tools and put your own business card on there instead. And then you can just wear it at events. And um, if you are a man scanning men, that's not too weird, I suppose, like this. But if you're scanning women, well, you know. <laughs> Be careful of code of conduct violations, is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, you can have those, I don't know, if you maybe uh, shout out interesting questions or um, engage more, uh, clap. I think there may be enough for everyone in the room if you want one. Uh, if you don't want one, maybe you take one home as a gift to someone you know, because they are quite pretty. They are all original as well, because I just make them using resin and I'm not very good at measuring and mixing, so I just throw stuff in and in different proportions. So every single one is an original piece of art. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to talk about the trolley problem. How many know what the trolley problem is? Really not that many. That's quite interesting. Why are you here if you don't know? <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about autonomous vehicles, driver assistance cars, our responsibility to build responsibly, uh, object recognition, what we do with it. I'm going to show you how to train and deploy a model. Super, super easy and fun. Has anyone played with custom vision in Azure? Really? No. It's super easy and mostly free. That's free, I think. There are some bits that are not free, but mostly that's free. That's free. Uh, and yeah, some things to think on. And if we have time, I'll, you know, spend some time making fun of Elon Musk and his Teslas. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so what is the trolley problem? It is not this kind of trolley, I should say. Uh, I did my degree in philosophy way, 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 way back in the day. Uh, I know what you're thinking, she doesn't look that old. <laughs> but it was uh, quite a long time ago, and uh, I specialised in e ethical and moral philosophy, which I, I loved. So any opportunity to talk philosophy, I am uh, all up for it. Uh, then I went on to do my computer science masters, where I specialised in AI, um, and I did my dissertation on Eliza. Do you all know Eliza? Remember Eliza? the old people. I say the old people, obviously, are the same age as me. <laughs> um, it, it was a, a chatbot, but back then, chatbots were really not what they are now. Um, so, yes, it was very, very simplistic, and I actually hard-coded a lot of that stuff. It wasn't at all AI as we know it. It was just designed around tricking people into thinking that it was a human, but it wasn't. Trolley problem, though. When we talk about the trolley problem, we mean these, or we mean trains, or in the modern context, we mean autonomous vehicles. The original trolley problem is a philosophical thought experiment. Uh, and what they said is, imagine some train tracks in front of you. And what you have is one of those junction boxes where you can switch a train from the track it is currently on to another track. Now, on the other track, is a railway worker who is repairing the line. He has his work order, he knows the line is shut, and he is free to have his headphones on and just be repairing that line. No one is gonna run him over. 
However, what has happened is a nefarious villain has come along and he has tied five kidnapped hostages to the main track. So you in your little controller box, you can see what has happened here. You can see there are five people tied to the line there. You can see there is one legitimate railway worker on the other track. The train is coming. It is too late to stop it. Somebody is going to die today. <laughs> I should have started with... <laughs> <laughs> I should have started with, I'm English, obviously. I um, am now Australian. I've been living in Australia for more than 10 years um, in England. I leaned into my sarcastic sense of humour and was equally cynical with that. In Australia, they are worse. <laughs> they are very casual. They have no respect for anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I, while I'd like to say I'm going to avoid being scandalous and saying shocking things, if you are of a delicate disposition, you may want to leave the room now. Um, anyway, <laughs> where was I up to? Oh yeah, someone's going to die today. Who shall it be? What shall we do? So if you are the controller, how many people are pulling the, the lever so that the train goes onto the other track and kills the railway worker? Oh, really? Murderers. <laughs> you are aware that in the real world, the action that you take there causes the death of a man, a man who thought he was safe. You have actively killed him with your action. <laughs> and I think the court of law would say that they don't know for certain that those five people were going to die. But you have actively caused that one person to die. <laughs> now, you see the problem that we have here. We are in a no-win scenario. Obviously, if you are outcomes orientated, you are thinking, for the world, for the people, for humanity, saving five people is better than saving one, and therefore we should save five. However, if you are thinking of your own um, self, then you would will probably not do anything, because in that case, you just didn't see it. You didn't see it. It just happened. Um, yeah, who can blame you for that, right? terrible, tragic accident as a result of a nefarious villain, but nothing to do with you. Um, so there are people in this room who are intrinsically trying to do the right thing. Good people, murderers, but good people. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are, you know, self-serving, lazy, non-murderers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, it's a delightful situation that we have here. <laughs> okay, further in the trolley problem. Okay, for the, for the ones that said they would save the five, let's just look at them. Um, let's look at it from a different angle. You are standing on a bridge over the railway, so you don't have access to the lever. Um, you're standing on a bridge over the railway and the five people are there. You can see them. The train is coming. There is actually no, no way to say any other way. But there is a big fat man standing on the bridge. If you push him off the bridge, he will block the train. <laughs> so again, one person will die, five will live. Are you going to push the fat man? <laughs> It's, it's exactly the same. You are killing, killing one people to sell, save five. Are, are we doing it? Are we still? Yes. No? <laughs> <laughs> so, some people are having a problem with it because, of course, there you are, you are really taking an active murderer's position here. You're, you're <laughs> 
I mean, it's not just pulling a lever, it is actively killing someone, an innocent man who was just waiting for his dinner. Um, but still, yes, outcomes are the same. So if it's outcomes, it's the same. Anyway, that's the trolley problem. <laughs> There are actually many variations, so I recommend if you enjoyed this, then look that up because uh, there's a lot of choices around that. But yes, um, this is a predator drone. I mean, it's not a predator drone because, you know, the army doesn't really like you to have detailed up close pictures as to their, their drones. Uh, it is what we would call the trolley problem of the skies, a more modern day trolley problem as it is in reality, in that we have put these drones in the skies. They have saved so many thousands of lives, of army people's lives, who don't have to go into the direct line of fighting anymore because it all can be done with, with one of these or, you know, something more viciously equipped. However, because you are no longer directly having to kill people with your own hand, you're not having to push men off bridges, you're not having to see the look in people's eyes as you kill them, it is a lot easier to kill people. You can kill hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. In fact, the numbers are not... I'm not encouraging it, Danny. <laughs> I'm just saying it's possible. And, um, yeah, and... We don't know. We do not know how many civilians have accidentally been killed by these because they do not publish those figures, and of course they don't. But it has made it a lot easier to kill people without thinking about it, without feeling the consequences. Okay, so how is that related to autonomous vehicles and what we're talking about today? Um, I guess the question is, in an unavoidable crash scenario, who do you kill? No, I mean, who do you save? That's what I mean. <laughs> yes. Um, and that depends. That absolutely depends, um, as we have already discovered. Now, are we going to um, brake and swerve into pedestrians? Are we going to pull the car off a bridge so that it doesn't hit anyone in upcoming traffic? Um, do we ask the algorithm to calculate the path of least damage? Um, do we tell it to preserve the people inside the car at all costs? Do we tell it to protect us, me, the driver? Am I the most important one? Or are there people outside the car that are more deserving? Probably more deserving, yes. Um, does anyone know what they currently do? What an autonomous vehicle would currently do in the case of an unavoidable crash situation? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, generally, there are a lot of autonomous vehicles just coming to a stop just stopping. They don't know what to do, they just stop, uh, which caused a eight-car pile-up in San Francisco last week because, yeah, you cannot just stop in the middle of traffic that is going fast and that is busy, but that is what they, they generally do, just stop. And indeed, in all countries, I think, currently where they are allowed to be, it is not generally... <laughs> They will say it is the, the driver's fault because although, although Elon is saying they are autonomous vehicles, no one else is saying they're autonomous vehicles. Everyone else is saying they are driver-assisted vehicles, which means the driver is responsible. They should be paying attention, although they probably don't need to have their hands on the wheel at all times. If something happens, it is the fault of the driver who didn't have his hands on the wheel. Um, I did see something in the Sun newspaper implying that when autonomous vehicles were all go in this country, it would be the manufacturer that was sued if something did something went wrong. I think that is unlikely. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so yeah, who do I save? Who do I save? <laughs> I'm not saying kill, I'm saying who do I save? <laughs> um, would you, if you are all the drivers of your autonomous vehicles, would you prefer your car to save you at all costs or would you prefer it to do the right thing for the world? How many people would prefer themselves? There's no definites in this world. <laughs> you may die, you may just be horrifically maimed. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yes, we do not know. I, I would say that um, if you have any choice in this, so, so generally, the car is coming to you from a manufacturer. It has its programming already in place. It also has its cameras. It has its hardware. It has its software. It has the world around it. And it has you as a driver. It has passengers. You're crazy kids that are all arguing with each other and throwing food inside the car. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things going on there. I think that if they are going to genuinely take it to the next level, they should have like a 20 question questionnaire that the, the driver answers when he takes control of the car. So when you buy your car, when you purchase your car, I think you should get a bunch of questions that say, would you rather save yourself or would you rather save people outside the car? Would you, would you do this or would you do that? So the car is aware of your morality and when it, <laughs> When it crashes, that questionnaire can be used in a court of law against you. <laughs> Does the car accept and it depends? Huh? Does the car accept and it depends? It's yes or no. You know it's yes or no to the car. It's one or zero. <laughs> I don't think a questionnaire would work at all because it's conscious, your conscious morality versus your instinctual morality, which would actually It, you, you, you would answer stuff in your, your calm state, which indeed might not, I mean, you might be wanting to change your mind at a later state, but it's too late then, because you're... <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is the car should do what you want to do instinctually, not what you would write down on a questionnaire. Oh, that is an interesting thing. How many people think that? That the car should behave as you would behave instinctively, as opposed to how you would behave in your most logical, rational mind. Who? I think this is quite a humane way of thinking. Hmm? I think this is quite a human, humane way of thinking, so maybe I should raise my hand. Hmm? I know it's crazy, but if we replace humans with machines, it should be at least a bit human. And it's a human decision, so. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> what does the car feel about this? <laughs> <laughs> that is it, isn't it? Currently, the car doesn't feel. Oh, hey, Rob. So the used car salesman is already selling me the upgraded spoilers and the chrome wheels. Do I now have to pay extra for the, the car will save me package? <laughs> <laughs> if it is a Tesla, if it is a Tesla, then you do, because all feature packages on a Tesla cost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I am very easily distracted and I would love to talk philosophy the whole time. <laughs> so um, I probably shouldn't. I'm going to move quicker now. Certain countries in the world. So where you are in the world, the culture of the country is very different. So there are certain countries in the world where they would definitely say, preserve my life at all costs. There are other ones where they would say, it is my duty, I am not going to go to heaven or wherever, unless I am, you know, more thinking of the world and so therefore save the other people and sacrifice me. There are some countries where they would say old people are the wisdom of this country. We should preserve those at all costs and little children, babies, have no real conscious value yet until they're... <laughs> 
till there, I don't know, 12, 14, 18, what should we say? So, so therefore, if there is a choice between the little baby on that side and the old person on that side, we should swerve into the baby. <laughs> Can easily make more of those, no probs. Uh, whereas all of this wisdom, irreplaceable. Other places in the world, complete opposite. So should the programming of the car be different country to country? And if they're all being made in China, obviously, um, do we then at delivery, yes, get it reprogrammed with the cultural values of that country and, and laws, because the laws as well are different country to country. So are we getting that uh, extra layer of programming added before we even add the layer that asks us what we want? Or are we just going with the very basic? And yes, as it currently is, uh, just say it's the driver's fault if anything goes wrong. Uh, I like this one because I just kind of think, you know, in this scenario, should the train be forced to stop just so people can get good Instagram shots? <laughs> it seems to me it should just take them all out. They don't deserve it. <laughs> well, Ugh. But what is a self-driving car? Or an autonomous vehicle or a driver-assisted car as the properly uh, legally aware people would calling them. Um, self-driving car is a wonder of AI technology. It is capable of detecting its surroundings and functioning without any human intervention. Should be able to go to so a level five self-driving car, should be able to go from point A to point B without any human intervention at all. It shouldn't have prior knowledge of the route. It, shouldn't, it should just be able to do it all by itself. There are no level five self-driving cars currently on the roads, but there are level, level two quite a lot. Um, and so what you have there is, you have driver assistance vehicles, essentially. Now we have, in Australia, we have a lot of uh, autonomous trucks and trains. We do have a bus in Perth city centre that goes around, but it goes on the same route all the time. And it has a driver sitting behind the wheel, even though he never touches it. Um, in San Francisco, a couple of weeks ago, they just approved a law to say that the Waymo taxis can drive without a driver behind the wheel. Currently, it's in pilot, so it's uh, beta testers, or what do you call them? Insiders, Waymo insiders, who can get taxi rides and they can't, they're not being charged for them. But yeah, there are vehicles on the roads in, in certain cities that are doing it. Oh, I probably will just mention the Teslas. On the Tesla Autopilot site, it still has the video up from, that they created in 2016 that Tesla engineers are now saying is not true because the, the video hat starts with a big banner message saying that the car is not a driver-assisted vehicle. It is entirely autonomous. And what you see in the video is as it is in real life. Tesla engineers are now saying the video was faked, that the, the route was hard coded into the, into the thing and that there were crashes on the route as well, which you don't see in the video. <laughs> but, but it is still up there on their website, claiming autonomous vehicles are a thing from 2016. It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting way that he's uh, going with that at the moment. As, as, as I said, I work at Microsoft and we take responsible AI very seriously. Uh, we have created a lot of content about, around responsible AI. And so if you are thinking of building stuff with AI and you want to be sure that you are building it in a structured way, following all the recommended guidelines and that you're not going to do crazy stuff without thinking about it, go there. There's a lot of templates, there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of um, guidelines, there's a lot of resources that you can use and you can build your stuff. Well, you can build your stuff on our stuff if you want. Uh, obviously, Azure Cognitive Services, marvelous, a lot of them free. Um, but even if you're not using our stuff, 
take those templates, take those resources, take those, those guidelines and use those and you will be a lot better off than you could be. I like to say that, so these are all the dates that, we, that uh, AI reached human parity. So the problem is generally not technology. It's not that these things cannot be done. It's that we humans get in the way. We humans are terrible people, as you have, <laughs> as you have seen, as we examine your responses today. You all want to take a good hard look at yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, te technically we can do it, but there are a lot of other things we need to take into consideration. So I'm going to go through some of those. Yes, lazy, lazy, lazy humans. And you will see how lazy when we look at my demos. <laughs> this is what we want from our autonomous vehicles. Of course, we would like to be uh, sleeping and watching movies and not paying any attention at all. Currently, if we are doing that, then we are at fault. Oh. Uh, this. Um, so, as I say, we have some marvelous um, cognitive services at Microsoft. From 2020, we had this notice on the Azure Facial Recognition Service site saying that if you are a member of the US police force, you are not allowed to use facial recognition. The reason for that is because they did not use it responsibly. When you use computer vision, you, you, know, you should be training your models. You should be getting a lot of data. You should be putting it in. You should be um, feeding it information about people of different colors, different heights, different sizes, different everything. And they did not. And then what happened was the models were telling them that that black man committed that crime. But in fact, because they had not fed it enough data, it did not know the difference between, it did not know there was more than one black man. And, and so any black man was the black man that had committed the crime. So we took it away because if you cannot be trusted to use the service responsibly, then we take it away. All the other ones were still there. Um, and other people were still able to use that one, just not the, the US police force. This year, I, no, last year I was doing this talk in Melbourne and the night before I did the talk, they, they withdrew it from everyone. They said no one can use this service unless they submit a business case, say what they're going to use it for, how they're going to use it responsibly and show that it is not their intention to use this service for evil. So... <laughs> I think it's a real shame because all of the cognitive services are super fun to use and it would be nice if you could just all play with them and all of that. Facial recognition, you can't do that as much. Facial recognition is one that you could have a lot of fun with. George made some very inappropriate proposals last night for that. <laughs> um, but it was being used in it for good in a lot of ways. So, for example, uh, human trafficking. It's a very good way to pick up whether people are being trafficked. You can pick up the fear in their faces. You can pick up whether it looks like they're being coerced. You can also recognize, are these people who have been reported missing? There's, you know, there's so many use cases where it's really good. There used to be a really good video that they had where it showed this, this child, this autistic boy in China, who had gotten lost in a crowded marketplace when he was, mm, I don't know, eight, younger than that probably, and he was picked up by facial recognition software when he was 14, and he was in an orphanage 20 kilometers away from where he had been lost. He was obviously a lot older, but the software is smart enough to be able to take the picture of what he looked like back then and extrapolate what he should look like now, and he was united with his father. And there were just so many lovely stories for how you can use AI for good. And of course, because so many of us are evil, <laughs> um, yeah, you don't, we, we have taken it away, and you have to, you have to ask, you have to put a use case in. 
However, there are still a lot of other good services like Custom Vision that you can just use for free and you don't have to put a use case in. So use those things now before someone uses them for evil, is my, my message. Okay, then I'm going to go through some of our responsible AI principles. So I'm going to start with uh, fairness, which I think is the basis of all trust. People want to know that um, if you are using AI to judge them for things, that you are doing it fairly. So uh, a good example of this is, um, well, we want to treat everyone fairly and we want to avoid affecting similarly situated groups of people in different ways. So. Um, for example, medical treatments, loan applications, or employment should make the same recommendations for everyone, uh, with, for everyone with similar symptoms, financial circumstances, and professional qualifications. So it shouldn't be, for example, uh, if I ask for a loan and Rob asks for a loan, they, uh, and our circumstances in every other way are exactly the same. Uh, they shouldn't say no to me and yes to him just because he is a straight white man and I am a woman. People want to know that that is the case, that we are fairly judged and things like being a woman, being, um, oh, well, I guess, <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, being a different colour, being from a different postcode, um, all of these things should not affect whether you get a job, whether you get a loan, whether you get, um, whether you get medical treatment, you know? Um, there are, and people want to know what are the deciding factors that you put on things. But that is a different, um, a different one. So here we go. Which way do we swerve here? If, you know, we're this close, we're definitely gonna hit, hit someone. Who do we save? Save. <laughs> Yeah, I so save the dog. Save the dog. Because the dog is pure of spirit. <laughs> okay. Reliability and safety. So this is around uh, yes, if we are applying updates to our Tesla, we shouldn't have to pay for the security updates, right? We shouldn't have to pay for the things that will keep us safe. They are definitely charging for all the feature updates, but uh, security should come down automatically and keep us safe. It should be coming reliably and often, um, and we should, we should be able to rely on that because one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest things that we have to fear is, uh, of course, is of course being hacked. We don't want our autonomous vehicle hacked. Um, it has been a big, it's not just AI, reliability and safety has been a big issue since the, like, since the start of technology. And by technology, I mean just like cars, cars and airplanes, for example. Um, you want to be certain that the vehicle you're getting into is safe, it is reliable, it's being updated, it's being maintained. Um, and this is, this is the same for AI as it is for everything. Oh, who recognized these three algorithms? <laughs> I, I used to say, if you, haven't, if you don't recognize these, if you haven't read these books, then you should read them. How, because they are classics. These are um, Asimov's Laws of Robotics. Uh, so if you have seen I, I, Robot, Will Smith, then you should be familiar with these things. I actually have reread them recently and I don't recommend you read them because they have not aged well. <laughs> um, they are classics, absolutely, but um, yeah, problematic. Just maybe watch, yeah, watch the movie. But as they stand, the three laws of robotics, I think they are uh, generally very good laws for robotics, but also good laws for life. These are things that we ourselves should be abiding by, not just robots and not just AI. Okay, so this is me driving to the airport. I mean, it's not me driving to the airport, but so many times it has been me driving to the airport. I, um, 
It's dark, it's raining, they have those overhead lights because there's roadworks which are blinding you. I have forgotten my glasses and everything is dark and blurry and I am panicking because I can't see very well. I think in this scenario, I would definitely trust the autonomous vehicle better than me because this is what the autonomous vehicle can see. It sees the world pixel by pixel. Its cameras are much better than my eyes. It can see in detail and there's more than one camera. I've only got one set of eyes and they are faulty. You are all just a blur to me, not to the car. It's, it's seeing it in, in many ways. These are the applications of computer vision. So currently, if you are going to have a play with our cognitive services, you can, you can play with these things. Um, image classification, this here, uh, it, the AI recognizes that that's a taxi. It's labeled that um, just from that. This one, um, object detection, that's what I used for the self-driving car. Semantic segmentation, this is what I prefer them to use in actual autonomous vehicles because you see how the car is blue, that's red, and these uh, cyclists are green. Pixel by pixel, it has colored them as opposed to just saying generically whatever's inside that box is the car. So I would rather they use that. However, in that Tesla video, it's definitely this that they're doing, not this, <laughs> which is not reassuring. Um, that one as well, image analysis, it said that's a person with a dog on the street. I mean, it could have said more stuff, but it's pretty good. If you, um, if you use PowerPoint these days and you put an image into a PowerPoint, it will automatically give you the alt text, which is using this um, image analysis. Face detection, we have talked a little bit about, and uh, OCR is my favorite thing ever, because when I was in university, you had to make notes in lectures, and now you, um, now you just take a picture of the words on the screen, or you, take, or you take a scan of somebody's PDF, and you right click on it and say, convert text from image and paste it, and it will paste it into, into your text. Magic, so many hours I wasted. Um, these are the ones, however, that we will be using for a self-driving car. So object detection, we've got there, but you see here with semantic segmentation, that is a lot better. It, it would be better to have this than it would be to have this. The difference is, of course, cost. Object recognition, object localization, and movement prediction. Because you do want to, you know, this guy on his cycle might be like swerving in front of you. You want to be thinking about those things. There have been some accidents with autonomous vehicles where the car incorrectly predicted what someone was going to do. So yeah, this is, this is me in my car. Um, here's my computer and here are my sensors and, oh, and my actuators are like here. Uh, whereas on there, you have a lot more. You have a lot more of all of those things, a lot more, com mm, I wouldn't say computing power, probably not. It's debatable with me, but I mean, for most people, it's probably, they probably have more computing power than the car. This one is the robot that we built. And by we, I mean, there's George. George also helped me build this. Um, it has an Azure Percept inside, which we used for the, the eyes of the, of the device and then we used it with some custom vision to um, make our own autonomous vehicle, mm, object detection vehicle, I suppose. It's not definitely not autonomous. This is what the um, Azure Percept saw. So we trained it to recognize cones and to recognize Lego men. Um, you can see there with that bounding box that it is, you know, the box stuff, it's not doing the semantic segmentation. You can also see by the fact that the boxes are much smaller than the cones that I was extremely lazy with my model training. In the, the correct thing to do on model training is to expand the box so that it, it shows you the whole cone within it. And I couldn't be bothered with that. I just said, yeah, cone, 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 like that. I put the lives of those cones at serious risk with that kind of lazy data science. Okay, uh, so this is the, um, this is how easy it is to do the training. I am probably 
No, we'll see. I'll probably not show you the whole thing because um, I might have talked too long about saving people. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's super easy. You just go in there. You can create your own login for free. You go in there, you hit a uh, new, new project. It's, uh, I've called it obstacle avoidance car. Um, I've given it some storage. I've given it, all of this actually is on the internet, so you don't have to try and remember for now. Also very easy to follow the Microsoft Learn Paths. For the Azure Percept device, it did say you should use a compact model. The reason you would use a compact model is if you want to download the model into like TensorFlow or something and you know put it in a like maybe you want to put it in a front uh, a web front end or something like that you want to add it to an app. Um, it didn't work super well like that and you don't need to download it when you're using an IoT Edge device. So therefore, what I used there was a general model. General model will apply some real world knowledge first before it takes the lazy training that I've given it. In this scenario, what I'm doing here is I put up um, 15 images of cones. The reason I did 15 first is once you put 15 in, it will do it for itself. So I could add another 100 and it will go through them and it will mostly label them and it will just ask you to double check it. So that was me being at my most lazy doing the bare minimum that I could, which was 15, and then adding more later. Obviously, if you're going to have an obstacle avoidance car in production, you're going to want to not do 15 images as your training set. Um, yeah, the other thing that you're seeing here is, yeah, that's quite nice because it's got the whole thing in there, but it was not always the case. See, in that case, I was just like, yeah, cone. But you can see there is part of the cone that is out of that. There have been, as I say, scenarios where cars, self-driving cars, have hit pedestrians because the training is not as precise as it could be, and it should be. Yeah? Is it always important when you shape around the object? Um, so this is uh, this as it is the object detection or the image classification it is using bounding box technology but you can absolutely do semantic segmentation which is pixel by pixel um, and you can yes you can use stuff to like shape it better there's a, a really interesting one uh, done by the Australian like forestry service or something and they have they have been doing um, object detection on fishes, little fishes, to see how the, um, how the mining industry is impacting the, the climate and the creatures in the local area. And so they, they had it, and yeah, they're doing it a lot more precise, not just bounding box, it's like really the shape of the fish so that it can label out what exactly is the fish uh, and, and check them. Good news is the fish are good. They're all fine, apparently. Uh, yeah, I did also train a little bit for Lego Man. Now, I have since redone this. I didn't bother to put it up because, as I say, I am lazy. Um, but when you are doing your training, you don't just want to be taking the images of the cones or the Lego Man face on in good light on the same background. You want to give it hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of images taken from every angle in every light on different backgrounds and different scenarios lying on their backs, whatever. But all you do is you do it like that, you label them up, you hit train, and then it does it, and then you have your model which you can apply. And so all of this for like the, the 15 and all of that, that only takes, well this video is nine minutes, but I'm not gonna show you the whole video. Um, for the 100 images, it took about an hour to train all of those, but none of that cost anything, that was free. If you were going to do it in production with you know tens of thousands of images, it's probably going to cost you a bit more. But play like if none of you have played with it, play with it. It's super super fun. It's super super easy, and it will not cost you anything. Okay, I think I will abandon this and go on to the next one: privacy and security. So. Um, this is the thing that people care about most, I think, around AI, apart from their own safety, is that their information is not being used for evil. Um, 
you all would be familiar with GDPR. Yes, generally uh, in Microsoft, although in Australia, they don't generally follow GDPR because it is a European regulation. Because Microsoft is a global company, we follow it because so much of the world is impacted by it. And it makes my job very difficult because it means I can't save any data, really. It's too much, too much effort. So, um, but it's a good thing. There is a little bit of tension, I guess, between how much better you could make the AI if it knew everything about you, if it knew all of your secrets, if it could see into your heart, then it would definitely serve you better <laughs> than, than not knowing that stuff. But also, yes, if people are using it for evil, then um, you would rather it knew less. So there's your tension. Here's a uh, Australian example. This is one of our highway patrol cars. Uh, that's a, a New South Wales car, but we do have those in WA where I'm from. Uh, they just don't say highway patrol. <laughs> um, that car, magic cars, magic cars. Let's see what all the things they can do. Let's see. Uh, onboard tablet computer to check license status, outstanding warrants, photo ID of the driver, mobile f fingerprint technology, front and rear cameras that record non-stop footage to a fireproof, tamper-proof safe in the boot. The two cameras can be the live images to the police operations room to monitor crit critical incidents. Three automatic, automatic number plate recognition cameras can detect unregistered cars, uh, drug testing equipment, Digital encrypted radio, so all that stuff you see in movies about scanners being able to pick up the things, not these, not from these cars. Uh, long range radar, long range radar can detect speeding vehicles up to one kilometer away on the open road. So by the time you have seen the camera or seen the police car, it is already too late. They were monitoring you before you saw them. Uh, handheld laser units can pinpoint individual cars in traffic, zooming in on an area the size of a number plate. And the latest laser unit also records vision for evidence in court to prove the police stopped the right car. Yeah, horrifying. <laughs> I mean, I suppose great if you are really catching bad guys with those things. Horrifying if you are tracking me. And people want to know, do you know where the line is? Inclusiveness. This is, a, this is a good one. So there are one billion people with disabilities around the world, and AI technology can be a game changer for them. AI can improve access to education, government services, employment, information, and a wide range of other opportunities. And inclusive design practices can help system developers understand and address potential barriers in a product environment that could unintentionally exclude people. What about me, of course, because, you know, this is mostly about me. As I say, I am getting older. I forget my glasses a lot. It is actually a lot harder for me to get out of my... I have a Toyota 86, so it's kind of like a sports car shape. And um, it's a lot harder for me to get out of that than it would be for me to get out of a more reasonable old person car. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not prepared to go there yet. <laughs> but when you are using inclusive design practices, you make things easier for everyone, not just people with declared disabilities, but for all of us who will eventually feel some of the impact of the world upon them. And so it is important that when you are building for AI that you build inclusively. There are a lot of recommendations in the resources that I have attached at the end. Transparency. This is one of the two uh, principles on which those other four rest. Where you have fairness and people want to know that you have decided fairly as to whether you grant them um, a loan or access to medical care or whatever. Um, they also want to, they want to see that, they want to understand. So if you deny them the loan, they want to know why you denied them the loan. 
what were the deciding factors. Now, with AI, you will often hear people talk about, uh, it, was, it was a black box scenario, we can't tell you. We don't know why the AI decided in that way. Now, when you're using a lot of Microsoft um, AI tools, there is a little, there, there, are, there are explainer models in there. You can tick the little box that says explain. Explain, tell us what models you use, tell us what, what algorithms you use, tell us why you did that, tell us what features you chose on. You can also, um, yes, choose the features. So if, for example, you find that it has hired all of the straight white men and declined all of the women, because obviously straight white men make better developers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, once you see that the tool was using gender as a criteria for its selection, you can deprioritize that or you can remove that feature from the choices so that it doesn't know whether the candidates are this gender, that gender or any other gender. Um, and then it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot more possible to be both fair and to be transparent because you are selecting and you are selecting out stuff. So that whole, like it's not that there are no black box systems, there absolutely are, especially, you know, things where you're, you're using neural nets and, and machine learning and it, it's kind of learning and growing, but it's not really an acceptable excuse anymore to say we don't know, the machine just did it. And people will never trust AI systems in that case. So yeah, they want to know why. This is the code that we used, and you should be able to show the code, for one thing. Um, here, I'm just looking at the facial recognition, and yeah, people want to know, did you, did you choose because of my color? Did you choose because of my height? Did you choose because of my gender? Oh, <laughs> this is, um, yeah. This is the uh, demo of the, how the robot works in, in practice. So what we are going to see here, we're just applying the model because first off it, was, it just had the general model applied. So it saw the books, but it doesn't recognize the cones or anything. So now it's recognizing the cones and the Lego men. And this is the telemetry uh, it's coming up and it's saying that the sort of percentage confidence that it has for recognizing cones and Lego men. Now, in this scenario, we did not tell it to do anything in particular with Lego men. We said avoid the cones. So if it's driving towards a cone and it sees a cone, it should turn. Now, here's the problem. You see, it has inadvertently identified Leo the lion as a Lego man. And you can see the moment in his eyes where he realizes he has been targeted. <laughs> Fortunately, he is very wily and he was able to escape the robot of death. <laughs> now, I said we did, not, um, we did not tell it to kill Lego men. We, we told it to avoid cones and Lego men, it, it would just continue regardless. Uh, if it did kill Leo on account of that, we would be responsible. We are accountable because we were the programmers. And when I say me, I, I mean George, obviously. Um, these are the different ways that people can be lazy. So uh, data science, for example, have you trained on enough people of color, on enough people of different heights, on enough people of different genders, on, on different, are they standing in different backgrounds and different lights and different weathers and you know, all of that. Have you done enough of that? Um, manufacturing, if the parts fail. Uh, drivers, if you are the driver, did you deliberately drive into these people? Uh, pedestrians, did you jump into traffic? Uh, and there's the programmer, did they put evil stuff in the code? I do have some evil stuff in the code, not just here. Here I just wanted to show that you can get the information from various different points. You could either do it in like a, a CLI, a command line, or you can also see in the portal where you get your information from. It's all pretty clear and it's all pretty obvious. 
Uh, the code was really, really simple, so we shouldn't be in any trouble over the code, apart from, um, yeah, this bit at the bottom here. This bit at the bottom here. This bit George put in. Um, and it, you can't read it because it's commented out, but there is an instruction there to kill Lego men. Now, <laughs> it's commented out, so theoretically it is not in the live code, but I think if we were taken to court by Leo the Lion for the attempt on his life, <laughs> that would be enough to condemn George. Well, I think you'd blame the person who trained that AI model because it doesn't know how to recognize the AI. Because You see, so your fellow developers might throw you under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Danny. Do Danny. you expect that people in Cork, Dutch, just Cork people, know anything about programming? So they cannot understand the code. They no, no, but they. No, but they will call an expert in to explain to them what does it say, and he will say, it was George, and George will say. <laughs> It was Michelle. <laughs> yeah. So I did just want to, I'm, yeah, I don't have much time, but I did just want to show um, what, what it looks like from a couple of angles. So here you can see it's not that serious in terms of, like, Leo probably wouldn't have been killed by this device. Well, on the one hand, you can see um, I have a power cable holding it back, so he, he was saved by that. And the other thing that you see is, although it doesn't know anything about the Lego men, um, it doesn't actually kill any of them. It, it does like push a cone, but the cone is undamaged in this scenario. And so you can all rest easy in your beds. Uh, everything, everything survived. Nothing was killed in the making of these demos. So, yeah. <laughs> So as I said, there's a bunch of standards and toolkits that you can get from our, our websites. I have some resources at the end. If you don't follow this Twitter account, it's called Ethics in Bricks. I do recommend it in that they have an awful lot of political commentary that is uh, very, very on point. And here's all the resources. Take a picture of this slide so that you can look everything up. Um, you don't need to use an Azure Percept device to build your own obstacle avoidance um, robot. You can absolutely just use you know, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and all of that, and it's actually better if you're playing with it yourself because they're much smaller. So, um, you know, but there is a lot of really good documentation around the Percept device that will explain how you do stuff. So it's fun to play with. This is me. We are at the end. As I say, I have these, um, business cards, which are um, four different shapes. They are controllers. When you scan them with the NFC chip in your mobile phone, it will, uh, so where you would put your credit card, it will bring up my link tree like that. Um, I haven't locked them, so you can download the NFC tools app and uh, rewrite it with your own business card details. So put your own LinkedIn on there or link tree or you know, I don't know, phone number, email, whatever you want. Very, very easy to do. Um, if you asked a question or made a comment, come up and get one first, and then everyone else, you can have what's left. Thank you for coming today.